um, historic preservation and sort of providing a transportive experience, those are two of our really most important parts of our mission um, was to bring the, the buildings alive and to harness an, the energy of the old commercial storefronts from the 19th and early 20th century. So the Franklin Fountain does that by bringing you into this soda fountain from the early 20th century. It's got the original penny tile floor. We uh, installed marble counters and the staff learns to tie their own bow ties and to wear the uniform of a soda jerk, circa 1920. At the candy store, we step back another 50 years, roughly, and we've restored lovingly the stained glass um, in the storefront, the curved windows, display windows, and all of the gorgeous, actually colonial revival woodwork that was referencing historic Philadelphia back in 1911 when it was installed. So it, it feels very intimate in the candy store. And we, we put a lot of energy into making that place feel authentic. Get ready for the sweetest episode of AMREV 360 that we've ever recorded. My guest today, part of the slow food movement, are bringing back the historic flavors of early America, just two blocks from the Museum of the American Revolution. Thank, Thank you, you so nice neighbor. Nice. Great. <laughs> so for those who are watching, uh, if you are here in the Museum of the American Revolution and you walk, I guess it's about two blocks, you know, block down Chestnut Street and up second on the way to Christ Church and you hit Market Street, you find one of my favorite corners, other than Third and Chestnut where we're sitting at the museum, um, that is the location of two businesses that you two founded. Well, Scott, it's a hive of activity. Um, there, We are actually in four different buildings on that little half block. Yeah. Um, on the corner, Franklin Fountain is a throwback soda fountain experience from the 1920s where we have uh, servers and bow ties and looking, looking the part, serving homemade soda with homemade ice cream in floats, sundaes, and we serve uh, a lot of ice cream cones and cups to long lines in the summertime. Uh, two doors down is the Franklin Ice Cream Bar where we marry our homemade ice cream with our homemade chocolate on a stick form. Chain Confectionery is America's oldest continuously operated uh, candy store here in Philadelphia. It's just right in the middle of that block and it, the building and uh, the confectioners have gone back to 1863. Um, that year is a significant year in history in Pennsylvania. As you can imagine, um, Battle of Gettysburg. Battle of Gettysburg. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. there was uh, industry happening in Philadelphia. I was actually an expansion of some confectioners on the block. Mm -hmm. And so we're making everything from hard candy, uh, chocolate on site. We're making historic cookies and bonbons and putting them in boxes. And what I think so amazing is, is you are not just uh, recreating old recipes, you are using original machinery, right? I mean, that's being cooked and produced uh, using the same gear that your forefathers in the candy making business would have used, right? The buildings are old, the tools are old, and, and Ryan is really the, the our resident uh, collector, interior designer extraordinaire. He's the, he's the guy that found all this stuff and put it all together. And we uh, have married our, uh, the craft with the tools. And so having the right tools allows us to be uh, more authentic storytellers, um, to get people immersed into the way things used to be made and of course, how they used to taste. So take us on a little journey back. Do you come from a long line of candy makers? Like how did you, uh, how'd you get into this uh, business here? So we had a deep immersion in history from childhood. And the year that I was born, our mother opened an antique shop in our home. And so the, the die was cast, <laughs> so to speak. So we learned about entrepreneurship mm -hmm. from a very young age, literally in our home. Um, going to shows and selling things and finding antiques and 
learning about small business. Mm -hmm. And then also um, got really interested in early Americana history because our parents had a soda fountain shop sort of uh, designed as their dining room. Oh, in our oh so you literally were living in a soda fountain. Yeah. This concept um, that we would graduate to after college, um, you know, 20 years later, in, in effect was sort of a continuation of some of the things that we had learned during our childhood. There's a lot of places I think you can go that there's a design that's supposed to evoke mm -hmm. a period, but it's not the authenticity that goes to the ingredients and the process and everything. So anyway, just to throw uh, a lot of a lot of love here. Thank you. Uh, just for me, because I, I really am a great fan of your work. Thank you so much. Oh, for sure. Uh, and I thought, you know, the other thing that I think is so meaningful to me as a historian is realizing the significance of your location for the history of the confection trade, shall we call it, in Philadelphia. I mean, Letitia Court, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to sort of uh, bring out an object. This is a replica of the original, but in a way, this is the object that first connected us together before the museum even opened. Um, in the collection of the Museum of the American Revolution is this hardwood carved cookie board, you know, mm -hmm. with a design mm -hmm. of an elaborately dressed woman on one side and a potted plant on the other. And um, it comes from a fascinating, I mean, like sort of the German Benjamin Franklin mm. of Philadelphia, mm. who lived mm. right behind where you guys are. Mm. His trash is probably somewhere under the ground, you know, where your building stands today. You want to talk a little bit about Christopher Ludwig? Absolutely. <laughs> sure. It's been one of the one of the best uh, collaborations we've ever done. It's yeah. um, so fun to bring about history through taste, where you can yeah. um, literally learn about uh, an American patriot that, um, you know, baked the bread out at Valley Forge, who was friends with George Washington, the, the, the first and only Baker General uh, in the United States. <laughs> Greatest Army. title ever, Greatest Baker title. General. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the meaningfulness of what it means to bring, bring out that history. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. so how do you, how do, what do you do with something like this, right? You know, how do you produce an edible object so, from a carved wooden board? <laughs> so thanks to you, we were able to uh, borrow it uh, yeah. carefully and gently uh, creates uh, silicone molds, mm -hmm. a modern molds that can be um, worked with. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a, a gingerbread dough is, is yep. produced in, um, mm -hmm. with spices and rolled out. And we, we actually freeze the dough and then we cut off parts of it mm -hmm. as we need to bake it. Mm -hmm. um, each, each of the dough is hand pour, uh, pressed, literally pressed into mm. the mold. And then it actually sits overnight in the oven, just sort of uh, mm. curing. Huh. And um, it's baked and then it's glazed and then it's packaged. So it's, it's can cut out um, that, that iconic tulip that mm -hmm. is on that, that yep. uh, the yeah, one I, side I guess is- I can show off. Um, one of the finished pieces, right? Yeah, it's quite available. And there's some of the, the Proctor design on the back. Yeah. So what uh, can you sort of expanding out from uh, the gingerbread breaking the period, how how is, are the kinds of uh, confections and cookies and that different in the 18th century, you know, from what's available at Chain today, for instance? You know, what, what would be typical of the kind of uh, things that someone like Ludwig is, uh, is making? So confections in the 18th century were, were very expensive. Sugar mm -hmm. was costly mm -hmm. and rare. So it was generally um, consumed by uh, the wealthy mm -hmm. at the time. They had pieces of furniture. Uh, we have one in our collection called a sugar chest that is locked huh. with a, a key. And you would keep that in your parlor to make sure that um, the staff and the children didn't get into the sugar because it was. If we so had costly. one of those in my house, my clothes would fit a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> so confectionery yeah. okay. at Christopher Ludwig's time, those those uh, cakes, as they were known, or cookies, mm -hmm. uh, were were quite special for reserved for special occasions and generally consumed 
um, by the elite, especially fancy boards. Even the wood that they're carved on, um, they often use mahogany mm. or pear wood or some kind of fruit wood because of its density. Very hard and dense. And then yeah. they would carve both sides. Mm -hmm. Why? To save wood. It's like a painter painting on both sides of a canvas. Yeah. Um, and so that gives you a little bit of a sense of how valuable the sweets were. And of course, today, you know, most cookies are deposited by machinery and <laughs> cranked out by the, by the millions. Yeah, yeah. And I would say too, the spice trade also affected that cost. And it was much, much agreed upon. Spices have always been expensive, but they were uh, extremely expensive. Um, and sugar was one of, considered sort of one of those those mm -hmm. spices as well. Um, in Philadelphia, there was a fairly large um, interest in dairying uh, by the Quakers. Mm. And so they um, they had access to butter and milk. And so I actually think there were a lot of cookies that used a fair good mitt of butter, um, like shortbread, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and those cookies also can la have a nice long lasting, great with tea, yeah. again, as a nice compliment. Mm. Now, we haven't talked about chocolate specifically yet. And so is there access to chocolate in, you know, the 1770s during the revolution? And is that kind of the same that we're used to today or is it is it different? Chocolate was consumed in generally by a drink or mm -hmm. um, a baker would use chocolate in some sort of confection or a cake or something like that. Mm -hmm. Chocolate was also quite rare. Chocolate, at that time, it's coming from the Caribbean, okay. uh, cacao. And one of the first chocolate mills where the cacao is turned into chocolate, which is basically the process of mixing cacao and sugar, is happening in the Northern Liberties, and mm. it's William Penn. Oh, wow, that and early. It's, it's called the Governor's Mill. Mm -hmm. And he engages with uh, a local... Uh, entrepreneur to basically run the mill. They also produced um, uh, mustard seed and other spices, as Eric was mentioning, in the mill. So it's basically a stone mill grinding this up. And it was one of the ways Penn thought of kind of boosting the economy in Pennsylvania. Later on, it was run uh, by his sons and they engaged with a fellow named Benjamin Jackson, who coincidentally or not, also was located uh, right around Letitia Court. Ah, so you are on you are on the sweet corner of uh, Philadelphia, right there. <laughs> it's it's amazing, and we did not know that when we acquired Shane's hmm. in 2010. Kind of an amazing story, but in the Pennsylvania Gazette in the 1750s, which was Benjamin Franklin's paper, of course, mm -hmm. Benjamin Jackson's advertising for two products: mustard and uh, chocolate. And there's actually a, a picture, an engraving in the newspaper showing the chocolate bar, what we believe is a chocolate bar from the 18th century. So we actually molded our chocolate bar using that image. And so we brought it. You have a for colonial you. Philadelphia chocolate bar. Is that what I'm sitting next to right here? It sure is. All right, Feel I'm going to pick it up here. Oh my gosh. Yep. And so it, it's very recognizable in that it's. It's scored for breaking off uh, right. pieces. And, and uh, so tell me just a little bit about the process of your, you know, you're starting with the, the cacao, right? We take the uh, beans and we roast them in the oven and then they're winnowed. Winnowing mm -hmm. is this process of removing the, the ex exterior uh, sort of husk mm -hmm. and the sh as like a shaft and the inside is, turns into basically nibs. The nibs are what is to become chocolate okay. when you add sugar. Okay. It's then blocked or poured into big giant chocolate blocks that mm. could be uh, 10 pounds heavy. Mm -hmm. We store that and then we remelt it when we gotcha. wanna use it. Ah. So it's remelted, it's tempered. It's like this luscious velvety liquid chocolate that then goes into confections. Well, Eric and Ryan, it's been great hanging out with you today. If someone's interested in um, checking you out online, what are your websites? 
come to the Franklin Fountain website, franklinfountain.com, yep. shanecandies.com. Bring your wallet and uh, <laughs> we'll be ready for you. Fantastic. Well, you know I'll be there soon. 